All right, welcome everybody. It is Tuesday, September 8th, 2020, and it's 6.30 p.m. Welcome to our City of Wausau Common Council meeting. Um, the first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, so please stand with me. Next up, roll call. You're gonna have to wait to, don't push your button yet. <laughs> we'll have time for that. Does everyone get excited to push? Old fashioned. Peckham? Here. Martins? Here. Killian? Here. Neil? Here. Wadinski? Here. McElhaney? Here. Watson? Here. Hertz? Here. Larson? Here. Ryan? Here. And all the rest is excused. So we have 10 numbers present. Thank you. Hello? You wanted to give him a test? Hello? Okay. Hey. All right. Moving on. Uh, we have proclamations. We have three of them tonight. Uh, so I'll start off with, uh, with this one, Constitution Week. Whereas our Constitution is founded on fundamental trust in America's citizens, and whereas on September 17, 1787, our constitutional framers signed the U.S. Constitution at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, forging a new government for the United States, and whereas the United States Constitution stands as a testament to the tenacity of Americans throughout history to maintain their liberties, freedoms, and inalienable rights, and whereas September 17th marks the 233rd anniversary of the Constitution of the United States, and we celebrate this founding charter and reflect on the privilege of being an American with all the rights and responsibilities which that privilege involves. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Katie Rosenberg, Mayor of the City of Wausau, do hereby proclaim this week of September 17th through the 23rd, 2020 as Constitution Week in the City of Wausau. And we encourage all citizens to demonstrate our love for the United States of America and the blessing of freedom our constitutional framers secured for all of us. I think we have somebody here um, to accept this proclamation. I accept this on behalf of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Thank you. All right, our second proclamation is 2020 National Suicide Prevention and Action Month. Whereas September is known globally as Suicide Prevention Month, the National Suicide Prevention and Action Month proclamation was created to raise visibility of the mental health resources and suicide prevention services available in our community. The goal is to speak openly about the importance of mental health and the impacts of suicide to help remove the surrounding stigmas and to direct those in need to the appropriate support services. And whereas suicidal thoughts can affect anyone regardless of age, gender, race, orientation, income level, religion, or background. And according to the American Foundation for Suicide Pre Prevention, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death among adults and the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 10 and 34 in the US. And whereas more than 47,000 people died by suicide across the United States in 2017, which according to the CDC was more than twice the number of homicides with an average of 129 suicides completed daily, which includes active military and veterans accounting for 13.5% of all suicides nationally. Whereas each and every suicide directly impacts a minimum of 100 individuals, including family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, and community members. And whereas WASA is no different than any other community across the country, but chooses to publicly place our full support behind local educators, mental health professionals, athletic coaches, law enforcement officers, and parents as partners in supporting our community by being available to one another. And whereas every member of our community should understand that throughout life's struggles, we all need the occasional reminder that we are all fighting our own battles. 
And whereas I encourage all residents to take time to check in with their family, friends, and neighbors on a regular basis, and to honestly communicate their appreciation for their existence by any gesture they deem appropriate, a simple phone call, message, handshake, or hug can go a long way towards helping someone realize that suicide is not the answer. Now therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Katie Rosenberg, Mayor of the City of Wausau, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as National Suicide Prevention and Action Month in Wausau. All right. The next one um, is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas childhood cancer is the leading cause of death <laughs> and disease in children, whereas the most common cancers in childhood in Wisconsin include leukemia, brain and central nervous system, tumors and lymphomas, and whereas one in 285 children in the United States will be diagnosed by their 20th birthday, and whereas 43 children per day are diagnosed with cancer annually in the U.S., and whereas there are approximately 40,000 children on active treatment at any given time, and the average age of diagnosis is six years old, compared to 66 years old for adults cancer diagnosis. And whereas in the last 20 years, only four new drugs have been approved by the FDA to specifically treat childhood cancer. And whereas the National Cancer Institute recognizes the unique research needs of childhood cancer and the associated need for increased funding to carry this out. And whereas hundreds of nonprofit organizations at the local and national level include the American Can Childhood Cancer Organization are helping children with cancer and their families cope through educational, emotional, and financial support, and whereas researchers and healthcare professionals work diligently dedicating their expertise to treat and cure children, children with cancer, and whereas too many children are affected by this deadly disease, and more must be done to raise awareness to find a cure. Now therefore, I, Katie Rosenberg, Mayor of the City of Wausau, do hereby proclaim September 2020 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. I encourage all citizens in the City of Wausau to observe Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and support this cause that so deeply impacts families and communities across our country. And I just want to make a little note that I'm making this proclamation in honor of Claire Hornby, an amazing 10-year-old girl whose family lives just a few blocks away from me. Whew. In May 2019, Claire was diagnosed with diffuse midline glioma. It's a rare aggressive brain tumor that currently has no cure. In January, doctors at St. Jude Children's Hospital found that the cancer had metastasized to Claire's spine. Whew. This morning at 3.09 a.m., Claire left this earth. Her family says that she has joined those who earned their place before her, including her dear friends from St. Jude, her great-grandparents, and her grandpa's dog, Abby. I'm just going to take one second here. Okay. Right now we are moving on to public comment. I want to thank you everyone for joining us. We have quite a few people signed up, pre-registered. Um, you'll each have three minutes um, to give your public comment. Um, and I'll start with the order in which you've signed up to speak. Um, the first person I have is Deb Ryan. Deborah Ryan, 702 Elm Street. Uh, I wanted to say that I've been um, leading the Westies neighborhood group for over six years. Um, our neighborhood group has been um, it, within the Wausau and meeting regularly for over 10 years that I'm aware of. And our boundaries are from First Avenue to 17th Avenue and from Stewart to Bridge Street. Uh, it happens with within our boundaries. We do have three different older persons that are pieces of that. So uh, for Grant School, um, Sarah is is uh, Larson is is the older person, but um, that's part of our neighborhood boundaries, and so I consider it as well as something that I'm concerned with. Uh, for myself, I'm. I'm a transplant, so I'm not a native of Wausau. I grew up in the UP. But I really cherish older buildings. My house is 100 years old today, uh, this year, excuse me. And um, I had air conditioning added over 14 years ago. Um, 
And um, from, from talking to other people that have grown up in my neighborhood, and some are in their 70s, that they're talking about stories about the grant school. And it's hard to imagine that back years ago, Fourth Avenue was the western boundary for the city. And that um, I have requested from the school board information about Longfellow, which is the administration portion of the school district. But that is a historic building that has been upgraded over the years and is considered up to date and relevant of where the administration building is now. So uh, I know you can, I know if you look at it, you could make upgrades to grant school. I have, through the Rise and Shine Girl Scout program back in 2005 and 6, had attended the various schools, either for the morning program or the noon program. Back in those years, I was doing uh, Lincoln for after breakfast and was going to grant at noontime. So I have been in the building and that I do think um, I'm speaking for myself, um, not as part of the council, but also when you look at consolidating two schools, the worst location for traffic would be anywhere near Bridge Street. Um, I'm aware of a lot of people speeding on 4th Avenue to avoid going on 1st Avenue, and there is all residential single family homes in that area. So um, in my opinion, for traffic flow, um, consolidating at Grant School is the worst decision, in my opinion, if you looked at traffic. And I think there's other opportunities. Thank you. I, I would also like to just to mention briefly that we have invited the school district to our Westie's Neighborhood Group meeting, which will be outdoors tomorrow night at the Reservoir Park Shelter. And it's a, a townhouse style with questions and answers so that residents can ask anything of the school district and if you don't have enough opportunity you, or Dad. not available tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next, um, we have Gary Gisselman. If you could state your name and address for the record, please. You have three minutes, just a reminder. But you know that. Pardon? My name is Gary Gisselman, 319 Park Avenue, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54403. I speak this evening against the proposed referendum uh, proposed by the Wausau School Board. Uh, as part of that referendum, it calls for the raising of Grant School. Uh, work as a preservationist in this city for quite a while and concerned about its history. I'm really concerned about this, uh, the raising and tearing down of this school. As part of a recent historic preservation survey conducted by the city um, a couple years ago, a consultant said that retaining a good degree of integrity, the former Sixth Ward School, later the Grant School, is recommended as a potentially eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. It is indeed important. It's an important part of, uh, of the city. It's considered important because of the history of the building itself and because of the architecture, the architecture designed by Henry Van Rin of Milwaukee, who was uh, who had designed a variety of buildings in this city, uh, they still stand. Um, they still are very active within the community, and the, also the history. Uh, at one time, the Grand School was called the Sixth Ward because, in the early days, when this uh, when the Grand School was built, 1910. It was built in a neighborhood. The school board at that time felt very strongly that we should be covering the neighborhoods of the of the uh, of the city, uh, the northwest side, the old Columbia School. It's gone now, of course, been replaced through the years, but they were placed very strategically throughout the community as neighborhood schools. And Grant School, being the sixth ward sort of a representative of that ward on the north, what was, uh, now it's the, uh, the west central part of the city, but at that time it was the northwestern part of the city. So it's very important that I think the, the citizens of the city of Wausau consider 
what this referendum calls for. Um, this, this building is very important. All the, all the buildings in this city, that are especially on the historic register, on the national register, the district, the historic districts that we have, we have two national historic districts. We have a lot of different historic buildings all in the National Register of Historic Places. And Grant School is certainly part of, uh, potentially part of that. So I think that as Grant School tells a story that tells the story of that neighborhood, so does other building. This building, for instance, tells the story of all of the Wasa Insurance Companies and their formation. The, what's left of the Wasa East High School, now, now apartments, that tells the story of the Civil, Civilian Works Administration during the New Deal. And you can pick a variety of these historic buildings throughout the city that tell the, tell the hist history of this building, of this city. Thank you. And, it, uh, and, I, th and I think it's important for the, for the citizens of the city of Wasa uh, to realize what this referendum does indeed call for. We're losing a little part of our history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gisselman. Um, next person is Christine Martins. If you could say your name and the address for the record. Again, you have three minutes. Good evening. I was afraid I'd follow Gary. Uh, I'm Christine Martins. I live at 1228 Arthur Street. And I am uh, currently the president of the Friends of Wassa Historic Landmarks, the vice chair of the Wassa Historic Commission, a self-professed history nerd slash geek, and a longtime volunteer at the Marathon County Historical Society. Although I do not longer, I, I no longer have children in school here in the Wassa School District, I do agree with uh, the speakers you'll hear after me in regard to combining of schools and being against that. But as you may have guessed, I am here about the history of Grant School and the destruction of a local landmark. As stated in the Historical Architectural Surve Survey of 2017-2018, which if you don't have a copy of as the City Council, you ought to. It's really good reading. Uh, Grant School is a good candidate for the National Register of Historic, Historic Places. Not only the National Historic Register, but the local register as well. Uh, it was built in 1910, and it was, it was designed by noted Milwaukee art architects Van Rin and DeGelke, as Gary mentioned. It is a fine example of the classical revival style. Uh, Van Rin and DeGelke, DeLecke also designed the Longfellow School, which is still with us today as the Wassa School District um, Central Building. Irving School and the Cyrus Yaki House, which of course is open for tours today. Uh, in addition, they also designed several other buildings around the central Wisconsin area. They were a known group, a known quantity in the area. Grant may have been built on the edge of town, but it has become an important part of the neighborhood and of Wausau as a whole. The raising of this building would be a loss for the whole community. Our architectural heritage needs to be preserved for those who are here now and for those who will join us in the future. I end with two questions. Have other avenues been explored? Is the destruction of a local and historical treasure the only way forward? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I have Mark holt If you could state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Three minutes is going to be tough. My name is Mark holt uh 625 South 4th Avenue. Uh, I come here to uh, oppose the referendum for a little bit different reason. Um, my kids uh, were former um, students of Lincoln Elementary School, and the idea of closing Lincoln, tearing down Grant, and creating the now largest K-5 um, school in the district when you look at kindergarten through fifth grade students, uh, considering the neighborhood that it's affecting uh, is quite troubling to me. Uh, for those that don't know, which I'm sure most of you do, this neighborhood consists of the highest uh, percentage of those students that receive uh, free and reduced meals at school, so uh, quite a bit of poverty in the neighborhood, as well as the highest percentage of ethnic minorities of any um, schools in the, in the district. Um, studies have shown that smaller schools, um, schools in the 300 range, uh, 
result in better performance of students, especially with considering socioeconomic and ethnic background of those students. The district put together what I thought was a pretty good initial proposal. Uh, the proposal was to do similar things across the district and uh, combine a lot of schools, create an intermediate school, a middle school, uh, and address some of the concerns that they have that way. Uh, they talked to the public. The public said, we like our neighborhood schools. Um, the school district said, OK, um, we'll just do it to this neighborhood rather than the entire district. Um, they then presented this at one board meeting where there was 22 minutes of discussion. Um, there was many, many public letters written to the school board. For the two weeks that it was open to the public, they held the next meeting with zero discussion and passed the referendum proposal as it is shown right now. Uh, I do not think we were included in this discussion as a neighborhood. And uh, it is my feeling that uh, more time should be taken, especially considering the situation the schools are going through right now with the global pandemic we're all going through and virtual schools starting. And I believe that this referendum is not right for the families of the districts that it represents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Bo Lee Vang. Hi, my name is Ku Her. I had asked Bully to read my letter in case I didn't make it here on time, but I'm here. So I am at 9848 Siberian Drive in Weston. I don't know how much words my, or how much merit my words will hold as I am a Weston resident, but I did feel a strong need to come and address city council tonight in regards to the proposed school referendum. I wanna make it clear that I'm addressing you as a private citizen, not on behalf of my employer or any organization I currently serve. So I am a registered nurse by background for the last two years. My role within my employer has been dedicated to addressing social determinants of health. We know that where we live, where we play, our access to food and transportation affect our health, even more so than the yearly trip to the doctor's office. We know that children living in poverty have higher adverse childhood experiences and higher events of trauma, both which carry over into adulthood, affecting the health of the person and the overall health of the community. It costs less to invest in our kids now in order to build a strong, healthy, and resilient community. With that being said, I want you to ask yourself if the school referendum is truly investing in our children. We're talking about putting the highest amount of low income and minorities into one building. What kind of environment will this be? What kind of culture will this school have? Most importantly, what messages are we sending to these children if we segregate them into one school? Are we setting them up for a strong future or are we increasing their risks for adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and education inequities, all, again, which will affect them as they become adults? How do we address these social inequities? I don't think building a new school and throwing money at the problem is the solution. I think the solution starts at the very top of an organization with leaders much like yourself that are willing to address these social inequities. I don't see that happening in the situation with the school referendum. I see leaders making decisions based on what they think would be right without considering how their decision affects the populations that they're supposed to be serving. As a nurse fighting to close the gaps of social inequities, the referendum works directly against what I and so many others have tried so hard to work towards. I have to add, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Nobody knows how long this is going to last. So if the referendum passes, the school is built. Students are back in school, ideally. But one student or one teacher gets COVID-19, it's putting 400 plus students, staff, and support, uh, teachers and support staff at risk. It's scary that the WASA school board expects the community to vote on this issue in November when our community members are really struggling to pay rent or buy groceries. They're really not focused on a school referendum right now. So ask yourself if this is the best time for the referendum and if this is the best route for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have uh, Charlotte Vang. If you could say your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Charlotte Vang, 506 Sherman Street, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54401. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My parents are Yang and Mary Tao. I currently attend Wausau West High School as a freshman. 
I attended Lincoln Elementary from K through fifth grade and then sixth through eighth grade at John Muir. What I loved most about having a neighborhood school was the ability to walk two blocks. I served as a safety patrol for two years and it allowed me to safely cross students to get to their homes quickly. I appreciate the diversity at Lincoln and all the teachers that dedicated their time to teach us. If the Wassa School Board and administration decide to merge Grant and Lincoln as well as change the future boundaries, this will impact everything meaningful to me. Especially when I'm starting to build my voice as a, and identity as a young teen, this will be extremely hard on me and everyone else. I've been staking yard signs with our campaign because I love equality, I love equality, our community, and all my friends. Oppose this unfair and unfriendly referendum with my classmates and I. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Mary Ann Young Tao. Go ahead. Uh, Yang Tao, 506 Sherman Street, Wassa, 54401. And, excuse me, Mary Tao, 506 Sherman Street, Wassa, Wisconsin, 54401. I will be occupying the full 30 minutes of Yang's time and my time to address all of you this evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council, for allowing me to appear in person and address public comments tonight regarding the Wassa School District referendum agenda. The school district superintendent, administration, and board should feel ashamed that we have to bring a school district issue to the City Council to share our community input and opposition on the upcoming referendum. It is extremely embarrassing and it speaks to the leadership at the Wassa School District. If they can't keep their house in order, thank you, Mayor and Council Members, for opening up your platform and your forum to afford your citizens the opportunity to be heard and to be seen. As you listen to Dr. Hilt and his administration team present tonight, I want the following information prefaced. We, the dismissed and marginalized community who are overlooked consistently throughout the last three decades, that we are here to oppose the referendum for the reasons that I will mention, but not an exhaustive list. This past April, Plan A, the most community effective plan, seemed right to all of us. At that time, Rib Mountain parents assembled their resources and they took action. They sent comments, letters, and messages stating their opposition to Plan A per a Rib Mountain parent who shared that information with me. Plan A involved closing Rib Mountain and repurposing Maine for the Montessori Charter School. Maine was the top choice for the future home of the Montessori Charter School per a Montessori parent who shared that information with me. A hand-picked task force was developed in mid-May of this year. This task force lacked diversity. It did not have any person of color part of that task force. The Asian community is the largest growing ethnic minority growing in this community, and not one person of color was a part of that task force. I've asked Dr. Hiltz to provide me information on the task force information, the list, and educational research that support large schools. And I'm not talking about teacher to student ratio large. Since early August when I sent this information, I have still yet to hear from Dr. Hiltz. When I had a phone conversation with Trisha Zunker, the school board president, I asked her who was all part of that task force, and I asked her what, was, what plans were being developed. She did not know. As a leader of the school board, how can you not be informed of the plans being drafted that will impact all students and citizens with this $155 million referendum? Furthermore, a phone survey was completed like what Dr. Mark Holdhusen said earlier regarding Plan A. Those results came back and the common themes were, keep our neighborhood schools, no busing, and if it's not broken, don't fix it. If that was the case, how did this hand-picked task force, administration, and school board decide to give away Lincoln to Montessori and merge Lincoln with Grant and build a new large school? Let me remind all of you that five years ago, this very same administration and the board said that Lincoln Elementary was too expensive to maintain because of capital costs. But we found that that wasn't the case, and Lincoln was removed from that referendum plan five years ago. So fast forward to today, it's okay to repurpose the building for Montessori now? We find this to be very inconsistent again. And we were told by Montessori parents that Lincoln was never the, the top choice. If the school board would like our input, don't contact us after you've already approved your referendum plan. 
We do not appreciate special and behind the scene exclusive invites to participate in learning sessions only to be told what will be happening. We want transparent government and we want to be a part of the early planning. When plan B and C were developed in June, how come nobody involved the Grant and Lincoln community for our input? How come, there, how come this wasn't shared with the media like plan A? When we sent a petition of 200 signatures from mainly Hmong and white parents opposing, uh, it was dismissed by our Wassa School Board president. We were told that there were just people from out of town who signed the petition, which was not the case. Again, we felt unseen by this governing body. We are even more insulted by the fact that board members would think gifting us the, the bigger school with the best support system is the most considerate and helpful for our students. You will be told there will be double the resources if both schools merge, but it's just the same resources had they just stayed as is. It may feel good for them, but we felt handed down. G.D. Jones Elementary had an expansion five years ago with that last referendum, which shows a similar social economic makeup if this merge happens. We found that the academic achievement declined year after year since that expansion. There is data research that shows that Asian students have been failing for the last three years at G.D. Jones and white students haven't improved much. To bring the largest ethnic minority and low income students together will only mean we will continue to fall further behind. What you will hear later may sound like a great plan and it seems golden and cost effective. We feel dismissed and raped over just because it was the easiest battle for the school district to win. We're in the middle of a pandemic and the school board administration and Dr. Hiltz should have all their resources and priorities focused on reopening schools safely. This referendum has the worst timing and maybe that's what they wanted was for no one to pay attention or to notice. But do not contribute further to the division in this community. We ask all of you for fairness and process to have inclusion and to have equity. The city council, I commend all of you that you have taken a great direction to have equity and environmental justice. Stick to it. You're leading the force right now in our community and I thank you and I bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Yang. Um, the last person who signed up is Christopher Norfleet. If you could say your name and address for the record. How you doing? My name is Christopher Norfleet, 221 Scott Street. Uh, first and foremost, I, I think we should, I want everybody to kind of get out of the bubble of Warsaw and recognize that there is a pandemic, there is an uprising, there's an ethnic wave trying to get us all to recognize that people in smaller groups have been far too long trampled upon in the bigger infrastructure of making things better. And when I say that, I mean, first and foremost, we have to start recognizing that now is always the right time to do the right thing. It's all right. And we also got to recognize that we have been saying do better for far too long. I can't go over the statistics and the history of these buildings, but we should not have to keep going over the history of excluding marginalized communities from being heard on a consistent basis. I've talked to uh, Alderman Killian about this perspective of environmental justice and not just what it means as a word, but what it means to people that look like me and people that look like uh, the Hmong community as to have a valid voice. And one of the things I hear here that is often crushing is that why do we keep waiting to do things to exclude to include people's voices in the process. It is one of the most hurtful things to decide what you're going to do and then ask me if I like it. Where is the preventive measure of today that where they had the opportunity to use their resources and their capabilities to communicate vastly greater to these communities who are going to be impacted by this to try to come up with options. Ultimately, you serve, they serve, to serve the greater community, not oneself. It's not about 
dashing uh, the administration from me. At this point, I really wish we would learn to put our guards down. Put the guard down. Why are we always fighting? Do we not see beyond these walls what fighting leads to in the greatest society we're living in? Who is going to model it? Well, I'll give the Warsaw police a, a thumbs up because they had no reason to champion being open-minded to change, to the possibilities that there are something wrong. Why not? It betters the environment. And it creates a justice for those who have not felt justice. At the end of the day, whether this goes forward or not, will justice be had by the community? Or will we further a fight? Will we further a fight and a division ultimately? It's on us now to be the better people to do Better. Thank you. Thank you. That is the last person I have for public comment. So I guess we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, the presentation from the Wausau School District representatives about the upcoming referendum proposal. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening. My pleasure to be here. Uh, I do think this is a healthy conversation. I appreciate the views that the, the community has shared tonight. Uh, and, and I want to share with you and, and those folks who are listening uh, the referendum proposal that we've developed and a little bit about the process and uh, a number of impacts. Um, my name is Keith Hiltz. I'm the superintendent of the Wausau School District. And I've got a number of folks with me tonight who are going to help present to you the, the information. Before we actually start, I just want to let you know that this project has been developed solely on the feedback, the input of community and staff over the last two and a half years. Um, what we've heard is, please support our students. Please make this a great place for people to work. Please make sure our schools are safe. Please don't raise my taxes. And again, please offer students the support they need in terms of behavior, mental health, social emotional learning, and we believe that this project is responding um, very robustly to that feedback. So uh, as each person uh, presents, I'll introduce them just so you, you recognize who's, uh, who's speaking to you and their position. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Diana White, who is our communications director. Diana? Good evening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got to this point and know that this was not a referendum that came together overnight. This has been years in the making. And it actually started in 2014 when we did a comprehensive audit of our facilities. So that's when the process actually began. But I'll take you through the timeline from spring of 2019 to where we are now. So in spring of 2019, we developed our strategic plan, which was whole child, whole WASA, and I will explain that in just a little bit. And then when we go to the summer of 2019, we did facilities planning. We assessed conditions at each of our facilities with the help of an independent consultant. In the fall of 2019, there was community engagement. We conducted community listening sessions and surveys to find out how the community felt and what they wanted to see with our schools. In the winter of 2020, there was the school board review. We reviewed our facility planning, the community engagement, and data with our school board members. From there, we go to spring of 2020, where we proposed a facilities plan to the school board and convened our task force. That task force was made up of staff, students, and community members and leaders. The community said they didn't like the original plan, so we surveyed the community and worked with the task force to develop the final plan, which is what you'll learn about tonight. Now I'd like to talk about the strategic plan that I mentioned just a minute ago, Whole Child, Whole Wasa. There are five branches within that, and I'll go over them for you. The first branch is achievement, increasing student learning by ensuring equity for all of our students. Optimizing our resources is the second strand. People, positioning the Wassa School District to be an employer of choice. Service, promoting a culture of excellent service. And the final strand, wellness, 
advancing the emotional and physical well-being of the Wassa School District community. Knowing that we've had a lot of community input on this, I'd like to share some of those facts with you. 76% of the community supported safety and security upgrades in our schools. 77% supported infrastructure repairs. 74% supported technology upgrades. 72% supported learning space improvements. 66% supported classroom additions. And 65% supported expanding pupil services spaces. And with that, I'll send it back to Dr. Hiltz. Thank you, Diana. Uh, if I could, I'd like to direct your attention to the, the presentation that we brought along tonight. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide. I'm not sure who's. You have to scroll down. There we go. So as uh, Mrs. White was talking, this is, these are the dates and some of the, the, the activities that occurred over the last couple of years. And the next slide, please. Uh, this is just the cover page uh, of our strategic plan, and you see the five areas, uh, the five goal areas, again, these all emerged from input from, from community and staff. And this referendum really is designed to help us achieve or make significant progress in each of the five areas on the strategic plan. And then one more slide, please. And this is the feedback that we received that Mrs. White was referring to. This came, we did three separate uh, um, scientifically, rep demographically representative phone surveys. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who, can, who facilitated the survey said they got the best feedback ever because of the pandemic. People were home and willing to talk. So they actually felt they got very rich feedback from, that, from those phone surveys. Um, so one more slide forward. And I'll just speak a few minutes about the, the, the project itself. Uh, this would impact every school uh, and the school forest in, in, in the district. All of our elementary schools, uh, we would improve the the secure entrances, making the schools safer. We would improve the infrastructure. There would be a number of improvements in terms of LED lights and ventilation systems and all those structural pieces that go into making a safe and comfortable school. Um, in the middle schools, those would be remodeled so we could return to that house concept that's been important in the success of students in, this, in the last several years. High schools were only uh, addressing critical needs immediately. Um, this academy models in quotes because it's what we're looking at is uh, another delivery system to help students and families better understand post high school opportunities, whether it's work and or education. So that'll be something you'll hear about uh, in a couple of years. And then district wide, um, IT infrastructure. Uh, this was the, the, the second bullet was very exciting to people. Uh, as you know, we have a number of traffic issues and parking issues and you'll see a little later, uh, there's some uh, improvements uh, planned there. One more slide. And then just a few additions. Uh, we've done a, a population study. It's projected that, that uh, Statine and South Mountain, those enrollment areas, those enrollments would grow. So we've got a couple of additions planned there. Also in many of our elementary schools, um, our, our, our cafeterias are driving our educational programs um, because we have to schedule lunch and, and FIAD separately, we would like to, to separate those. Then of course, we'll talk specifically to the merger that's being proposed uh, of Grant and Lincoln. We would propose to put Montessori at Lincoln. Um, frankly, earlier someone mentioned that Maine was the first choice. Frankly, Maine and Lincoln were both very attractive to the Montessori uh, board as we, as we spoke to them. And lastly, um, our school forest. You know, many of you may have gone through I uh, had some programming at the school forest. You know about the Red Lodge. While it's wonderful, again, we want to create a safer place. We want to improve communication capabilities from the school forest. We want to improve security. You've heard about a couple of the events that have happened out there. Uh, and so, and we want to do that in, con in uh, cooperation with the Wausau School Foundation. Could you go to the next slide? Lastly, uh, strong feedback throughout the last two and a half years from people about please, please, please support our students. They have significant needs and, and, and they're looking to us to help do that. So the second referendum question is specifically focused on creating full pupil services teams, which is one of the goals in our strategic plan. A, a, a full pupil service team includes a guidance counselor, a school psychologist, a social worker, a behavior intervention specialist, and a health aide. We would need 16 more certified staff and 20 support staff. Again, this is all being done 
at no tax increase um, because of the planning of the district. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bob Tess, who is our Chief Financial Officer for the district, to speak a little bit to the, to the financial aspects of the plan. Thank you, Dr. Hiltz. <clears throat> Could we see the next slide, please? This next slide <clears throat> begs the, a couple of questions, actually. Uh, this is part of our Why Now presentation, and there are a few more Why Nows on a subsequent slide. But one question this slide begs is, really? Zero tax impact, $155 million of bond issue, $3 million operational referendum each year, and you can do that with zero tax impact. And then the second question is, how can you do that? And I could go on for quite a while about this. I might lose some people. I know Mary Ann, you're into this. You might find it more interesting than some. But it's part of a deliberate strategy, a very deliberate strategy that the board has been in the midst of for the last three years. Uh, to best illustrate it, consider buying a home and financing that home over 20 years. And you have very little idea of what your life will be 20 years from now. And in that stretch, you refinance it maybe once or twice, you buy a car, you maybe tackle some student debt, and you really don't know what's going to be in your world 20 years from when you ish initial or initially take out that loan. Towards the end of the 20 years, you can strategically start to prepay some of your debt so you control the timeline. That's exactly what we've done. We borrowed quite a bit of money about 20 years ago to build East High School, and we did refinance it a couple times, and we did tackle some more debt. But now that we're getting towards the end of that repayment period, we have control with this strategy. We're prepaying some debt, and the timeline now is in our control. Last year would have been a pretty good year to go to referendum. Next year might also be a pretty good year to go to referendum. But this year is the best year for us to go to referendum. We can stop prepaying debt, tackle some additional new debt, and do it without the mill rate going down at all. And that's after, in the end of October, we're expecting our mill rate to go down 50 cents before this strategy is even engaged. So mill rate go down 50 cents, borrow money for necessary improvements, and have our mill rate go down. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates what's been on the mind of a lot of people in education over the last eight years. Since 2011, maybe as part of a strategy, maybe as a side effect or a byproduct of a strategy, the state legislature started to fund public schools not as much as they had. Started in 2011. And if you need to be reminded how schools are financed, it's a little bit under two-thirds financed from the state, a little bit under one-third financed locally, and the rest, very little, is federally. So most of our funding comes from the state, with quite a bit also from our local tax levy. And the lawmakers in Madison, perhaps as part of a strategy, but certainly as a side effect or a byproduct, caused that to happen. The state lawmakers said, you need to go to local sources to ask them if they want to fund your public schools because the state is not funding it at the rate they used to fund it. So in Wisconsin, over that time, per pupil spending from all sources has gone up 4.3%. That's an annualized rate of 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 over those seven years. The rest of the nation, annualized percent of 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. States have made a decision to fund their public schools, whereas Wisconsin has deliberately made a decision to let local decision fund their public schools. And that's what we're asking people to do with the referendum. Next slide, please. This is a little bit small, but maybe it can be entered in the record, and you will certainly see this chart in the next uh, two months. Uh, the, the area that's getting the most attention right now and tonight is the rebuilding of Grant Elementary School. It's about fourth from the top, $26.7 million to rebuild a Grant Elementary School. 
uh, when, a, when you consider a $155 million referendum, 26 million, I don't want to say it's a very small part of it, but there are certainly many other things that make up 155 million. The last significant referendum that we had that got spread district-wide was in 1999. In 2015, we had a referendum. It funded the building of four 4K academies, significant additions to the uh, tech ed areas at both high schools, and under $2 million was spread district-wide for district-wide capital improvements. So it's an area that's been ignored with referendum funding since 1999. So it doesn't come as a surprise that a new Grant Elementary School for $26.7 million is also met with many, many other modernization, upgrades, infrastructure, uh, utilities, uh, things like that, uh, technology that makes up the rest of the 139,000. There is a contingency built in uh, for about $6.4 million, and there is also inflation allowance uh, built in $9.3 million to bring $155 million. Again, grant's going to get a lot of attention. Putting Montessori at Lincoln is going to get a lot of attention. There are many other things in this referendum as well. Next slide, please. Dr. Hiltz referenced much of this slide already. Uh, all of our schools are listed across the top. You'll see dots in many columns. Safety and security. We are improving safety and security. Not that it's not safe or secure now. Uh, we're reconfiguring parent uh, student or parent bus patterns at some of our schools, most notably John Muir, improving the traffic patterns. Hawthorne Hills, improving the traffic pattern update fire alarm clock PA life safety systems, so they're called. We haven't invested a great deal in them recently. Every school gets that. ADA compliance, every school gets it. Build new classrooms to address overcrowding. Overcrowding comes in a lot of different ways. Sometimes the building is full of students and enrollment is beyond capacity. Sometimes it's in the way we offer our, our courses and our programming. John Muir is such an example. We're putting money into encore classes, some fine arts uh, uh, parts of the building, student services, and special ed. Uh, separate cafeterias and gymnasiums. There are four schools where we have one room that serves as a cafeteria and a gymnasium. So four schools are getting one or the other added. Remodel and repair learning spaces to support 21st century. Every one of them, OK? Update HVAC. I believe we have three or four elementary schools that currently do not have air conditioning. We're going to make sure every one of our schools has air conditioning. Uh, it was not done in the 2015 referendum because affordability was more of an issue in 2015. We once again polled the community. The community said $30 million is all we can do because it did come with a mill rate increase. Since then, our mill rate has stabilized. Some other debt is expiring. Affordability is a little bit greater now than it was in 2015, so we can do some of these things. Obviously, upgrade technology, student services, our pupil services department, special ed, uh, all of those things are happening. And then that last one, creating full pupil services teams at all of our elementary schools. That is essentially what question number two means. Next slide, please. This next slide is just a real small print, and you're going to see it probably up close later on. It, it's a one-page handout that captures much of what we're talking about tonight. You'll see it around the community. Probably too small for me to look at right now. The next slide, Keith, do you want to introduce Steve or should I? Okay. I want to introduce uh, another speaker tonight. His name is Steve Schonert, and he represents Nexus Solutions. And Nexus Solutions has been hired by the district. Uh, 2014, we hired Nexus Solutions, and they are in the middle of reviewing from an architecture and engineering perspective all of our buildings. And we scored on a scorecard every one of them. And we took that into consideration. And Steve is here to help us uh, talk a little bit about the climate of the construction industry statewide and a couple more reasons for why now might be the right time. Steve? Thank you, Bob. 
Again, my name is Steve Schoner. I'm with Nexus Solutions. There's been a couple of comments made earlier tonight about <laughs> why now and the pandemic. I could argue with some of the economic impact that uh, projects of this size have. Now is exactly the right time. Um, the project at 155 million will be approximately 40 million dollars spread over each of the next four years. Um, Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics and the Economic Policy Institute uh, reports that approximately 20.3, we uh, brought it down to 20, high paying jobs are created for each million dollars spent in the construction industry. That's going to equate, if you do the math, to about 800 jobs, uh, good paying jobs, direct jobs in each of the next four years. Aggressive construction market um, is expected in 2021 due to the significant cancellation in the public, but more importantly in the private sector. Private sector funding because of COVID has uh, uh, dried up a lot. Um, so you've got a lot of construction firms and mechanical firms, electrical firms that are gonna be looking for business in 2021. Um, so that means it's gonna equate to aggressive pricing. Uh, it means it's going to be great value for the uh, for the uh, taxpayer moving forward because you're going to get more bang for your buck. Um, so th those are the economic impacts of why now is the right time. I will reiterate that the the fall is going to bring the most people to the polls. Um, uh, so you get the best uh, a collection of voices heard. Uh, in the uh, election rather than say maybe waiting until uh, April. The other thing too, it's not on here, is that the interest rate, Bob alluded to it in uh, some of his past uh, comments, interest rate is at an all time low. We're seeing school districts borrowing 20 year money at two and a half percent, but yet construction inflation has been rising over the last 20 years at about 4.96 percent. So if you've got the needs, which the district does, waiting only makes it more expensive. Um, so with that, uh, that is the uh, economic impact of the project uh, as laid out uh, tonight in the presentation. Thank you, Steve. Could you go to the next slide? So clearly we want to speak specifically to the Lincoln Grant uh, portion of this, of this project. And you go to the next. This, uh, we've considered many uh, options. Uh, a little earlier we talked about the, the input. Um, we did have uh, Lincoln parents represented in our, in our task force. Um, and frankly, we are the, 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 a referendum is the one true opportunity that the community has to give their voice to the operations of a school district and to the future of a school district. Um, so these are the goals. These are the reasons we were proposing this. We do want to offer enhanced educational supports. We do want to offer enhanced social emotional learning. We do want to provide a state of the art elementary school in the city instead of just in the suburbs. We want to have stronger teacher teams. Got to have a little bit of educational research. Um, collective efficacy of teachers is one of the strongest predictors of student success. Teams of four or five teachers are more, they feel stronger, they feel more capable than a team of one or two, maybe three. And I can speak to that later if you like. Next uh, slide, please. Why? Why would this better support students? Uh, it was mentioned earlier, we would. We would be basically two staffs together. This would be the only elementary school in the, in the district with two principals. We would have full pupil service teams. Um, we talked already a little bit about the, uh, the, the amount of teacher collaboration. Very important point that there's been some misrepresentation of, of information uh, in the community. There would not be larger class sizes in the school. Larger schools, frankly, tend to have more consistent class sizes just because of um, scales of economy. Um, and we would want to have dedicated community spaces uh, for this, whether it be for service providers or PTOs or other community groups that would want to meet there. Next slide. Just a visual representation of what it is we're proposing. I, I'm guessing you're probably familiar with our, our district, but you can see the current elementary attendance areas. Um, I don't have my cursor, but that little blue one right in the middle, uh, that's Jefferson. Right below it is Grant. Right below it is Lincoln. Right below that is Jones. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll get a better look at that. 
This is what we're proposing. This, this new attendance area would be roughly the size of Jefferson or Marshall or Jones. And then next slide. And this is the attendance area. Uh, that red star there is the current location for Grant. That is where the, the, where the school would uh, be built. Uh, Lincoln, of course, is just down south of Stewart. Uh, that's where the Montessori school would be. So as we talk about neighborhood schools, we felt this was a both and solution rather than an either or. We are keeping a school in the neighborhood and we're giving this area, this neighborhood, which is still a neighborhood, uh, a brand new school, which we, we want to invest. You'll notice in this referendum, we're only proposing one new school and we want it in the city. Next slide. A lot of concern about uh, the makeup of the students. One, um, this is a rich, diverse, uh, community and of course the school would represent that. It's harder to see on this uh, if you get a chance to look at it up close what you'll notice uh, this is a, an, an ethnicity uh, bar graph if you will uh, listing the percent of students of color and you can see it ranges from a high of 60 I can't read it 68 maybe 65 down to a low of about 13. Um, we, in the middle, we show you that brown graph. That's what the demographics of this Lincoln Grant School would be, right? Yeah, very, thank you. Representative of the city. Next slide. Uh, this is percent uh, disability. You can see it ranges anywhere from 10% students with an IEP up to 26. Uh, this school would have uh, uh, roughly 20%. Next slide. And then poverty, uh, again, we range anywhere from 17% to 68 again. I'm kind of, this school would, would have a, 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 a percentage of students uh, receiving a free or reduced lunch of about 60%. Again, very representative of our city. One more slide, please. So why? Um, I, I will tell you, the, the folks who spoke earlier about the, the value of, I love old schools. Um, our focus here is on meeting the needs of students. So it doesn't matter what I like. What matters is how can we best serve children. And this would be a school uh, that would better support our staff, our students. Um, it would be a 21st century school for 21st century learning. We should probably start talking about the 22nd century pretty soon. Um, but it is our second oldest. If you've, if you've never been in it, um, there are some things that, that could be improved. People have done a nice job of maintaining it. Um, but frankly, we feel this is a, a good opportunity for the area and for the, the children and the families. One more slide. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, invite our, our school board president, uh, Ms. Tricia Zunker, to address the council. Thank you, Dr. Hiltz. It's great to see you all this evening. My Ho-Chunk name is Good Woman. Um, I am Trisha Zunker. I am the WASA School Board President, and I'm here to talk about equity and social justice, something that as an indigenous woman, um, this is something that I, 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 I recognize. Um, and to hear some of the comments, not just tonight, but in past conversations that I've had with people um, who are feeling disregarded, feeling not listened to, uh, that's something that has been very troubling to me and I've attempted to have the conversations about what this is about and it's about the kids. It's about improving opportunity for our students. So I wanna thank you for um, the time tonight. I'm sure you have a long, long agenda and uh, <laughs> we're still on the first item. So I appreciate your time and um, also, I want to thank uh, President McElhaney and Mayor Rosenberg because I reached out to see if there was interest in learning about the referendum um, and also about communicating as external partners to see if there was room for improvement. After a number of emails were received by the board from council members that were, uh, there was some mis misinformation. And I truly don't know that we could have come to you before now because this was a school board decision and it wouldn't have made sense to come to you before that decision in the event it didn't pass and just would waste your time. But um, just for a matter of clarity, because I believe in precision and clarity, um, this is something that's going to the voters, right? 
The school board didn't make the decision. Um, we don't need to have a referendum to uh, close a school or, or do anything like that. This is about investing in our future, which is our children, which is an improvement for our community, a long-term investment in the community. But it goes to the voters. What the board did is take the information from the administration based on community polling um, and make a decision from that and just say we're putting it to the voters. So, um, and as was addressed, there's opportunity now. It, it, does it feel great in a pandemic? No. This is the most difficult time for our administrators trying to keep our students and staff healthy and safe in a pandemic. But because of the higher voter turnout, because of uh, the lack of increase in taxes, now is the time. Um, so that's why we decided to go forward with it. Um, I, also, I also want to be clear just in the process, just very clearly, that um, there were actually two votes by the school board on this. It wasn't just addressed in one meeting and that was it. You can go back. Our meetings are available on YouTube. Our items are posted under every agenda. You can go back and see how long these discussions have been going on. So misinformation that was stated about that tonight is also um, something I just want to point out because um, we had a special meeting after we were already aware of this and voted to pass this referendum. It was a special meeting, it was final action, but we heard from members of the community and it went back on the agenda for a, a second discussion, a second vote, and that passed 8-0. It passed unanimously to put this out for the voters to have the opportunity. Um, and that's, again, what this is about, taking me back to the discussion of equity, taking me back to the discussion of social justice. Earlier today, I circulated a position statement to all of you, um, the WASA school board and district position on um, equity and social justice. And those aren't just words. Yeah, we issued it um, a few months ago, but uh, it's about being inclusive, about providing opportunity for our students. So. Um, the last thing I'll say before I actually read my two assigned slides <laughs> is that um, we, we're talking about opportunity for our students and there are two questions in this referendum. One question is related to Lincoln and Grant and one question is related to the whole district and having those full pupil services teams to have full-time um, nurse aides and uh, counselors and social workers in every building. Right now they are stretched thin between different buildings and when something comes up that person might not always be there and so this increased student support services is going to help and let's be honest it's not just going to help the students it's going to help everybody in those buildings. Question number two has nothing to do with Lincoln and Grant. Yet the signs that I see in the community say vote no on the referendum. I don't understand why we would want to vote against number two. This is all about improving opportunity for our students and giving them the support services that they need. So I just want to be very clear that there are two distinct questions here, yet that's not what we're, we're seeing in the community. Um, so to that end, I just want to remind everybody, if you aren't aware, the mission of the WASA School District is to advance student learning, achievement, and success. And this referendum does that. It supports equity in the WASA School District. It gives all students access to the same high quality learning environment. It invests $26 million in some of our poorest neighborhoods. You know what is so cool about this proposed school and grant? Is that it's a city school. When do you see people investing in a city school nowadays? They're always building outside on the perimeters, out where, you know, there's land development. That's not what this is. This says we are investing right here in the city. And this referendum also supports equity in the Wausau School District because it increases social emotional supports for all students. If we could go to the next slide, please. This referendum supports equity in the Wausau School District because there are, will be additional mental health support for all students, additional behavioral supports for all students, community rooms for every school, 
and it, it improves every school in the district. And one thing I want to say too about this um, proposed school at Grant uh, is that learning today doesn't look like what it did when I was going to school or when any of us were going to school. This is going to be a state-of-the-art facility, a 21st century design building for 21st century learning. Spaces are different. It's going to be so amazing. I mean, quite frankly, I wish my own son could attend this school because of um, this layout, the, the, the improved opportunities for students. So with that, I want to thank you for your time. Um, and I, um, I appreciate hearing from each of you that reached out. And I appreciate um, the ability to work as external partners in making sure that the information put out in the community is accurate. Misinformation spreads like wildfire. We do have a duty and an obligation to make sure that things are accurate and leave it to the voters. You know, they're, they're going to make their decision, but with an informed vote, um, not one based on other things. And I just hope everybody remembers to keep the focus on the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. I know we're getting long, and I know you uh, want to move on to your next agenda. So I'll start to wrap this up. If you could go to one more slide. You've heard this before. Um, why now? You know, we're projecting 90% voter turnout. We want to hear from people. You heard Mr. Uh, Schoenert talk about the, the, the need, the contractor interest, uh, and, the, and the support it would give to the local and the regional economy. You heard about the, re the retiring uh, debt and the, and frankly, this is the wonderful time to, to invest in schools. As community leaders, you know, uh, that when the seas are rough and people are panicking and they're distracted and they're not, it's not the time to give in to panic. It's the time to look for opportunities. This is an opportunity uh, to reinvest in the school district to protect the community's already, you know, hefty investment uh, to do what's best for kids. Uh, I think if we go scroll down through the next slides, this is just, uh, these are just concept drawings of every school. Uh, what would happen. You can certainly, you know, look at these at your leisure. Um, anything in blue is a remodel. Anything in green is an addition. You'll see a number of parking lot expansions, uh, rerouting of, of, we've had some challenging uh, traffic <laughs> patterns around some of our schools. You can keep just kind of slowly scroll through those. Um, or they could just be blank, I suppose. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> but, um, but every school in the district would be, would be improved. Um, there was a, a short video attached to this, but I don't think it will link because of the PDF. But again, we can send this to you. You can watch that at your leisure. Um, this is not what Grant Lincoln would look like. This is just a concept. You can keep going. That would have to be de designed. This is just one example at Maine. They, they currently have a cafeteria and a uh, gym that are the same. So this is how we, we just bump out. We build a new uh, gym or cafeteria. You can keep going. So I don't know if this is a format where we accept questions or if, if this is uh, too much time already. Um, but yeah. again, yes. Yeah, if, if any of the council members have questions, um, I invite you to press your light and ask them. Yes, Alder Ryan. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm a numbers person too with a master's in business, so um, I understand that, I believe it's Mr. Peck, right? Tess. Yep. Okay. Mr. Tess, yeah, Bob Tess. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Bob Tess, right. Okay. Um, I have not heard of anyone having a mortgage for 20 years in decades. Um, uh, since the 90s, most people that are going to have a home mortgage are looking at a 15 or a 30 year, but it's really based on 30 years. But um, I guess what concerns me, um, having lived in the area since 98, but uh, I have worked in Chicago back in the 80s on immigration for the, the, the major metropolitan Chicago area. So was with the first wave of immigrants coming from all over Southeast Asia, some from Ethiopia as well. And it just seems that um, in my, in my opinion, that um, 
Wausau had been pretty much a white community within that a lot of churches and Catholic charities and Lutheran child services were, were the sponsors to get um, the Hmong in our area. And it happens, I met and, and got to know quite a few people that went through major hardships that I guess I can't imagine as a, an American having to go through of Killing Fields, uh, the movie. Um, that is very poignant about how how they they came and and endured amazing uh, burdens and and losses and and people and then learning the language, learning how to fit in and I was working at Catholic Charities back in the early 2000s when we had the second major immigrant coming in from Cambodia where they were closing the different uh, camps. Uh, it happens that within the Wausau community, we worked well at, at welcoming people and an understanding, but we also have had people that they came with nothing, absolutely nothing, and were living in thatched hats, huts with, with dirt floors and uh, in a mountainous area of the country. And it just seems there was this kind of culture shock for them. And I guess I've listened to some of the recent um, school board meetings where I, I think uh, um, Dr. Hiltz, you had said, well, we can put Hmong in the, in the white category. Well, they've been our major minority for decades. And um, I guess I just don't feel that that is something that is appropriate to be doing. Uh, but I, in my opinion, Wausau is, is a town of 37,000 people. Uh, we sometimes have consultants or others that say, well, we should become Eau Claire. We should become Appleton. We should become a small Madison. And I think for looking at the referendum, if you had come up with three to five million, that's it. It probably would have been considered, but there's a lot more people here that are poor and that are struggling and having difficulties. And with the pandemic, it just seems to me to be outrageous. And especially with the, with the pandemic and you're not having the schools open, in my opinion, you should have saved two to $3,000 this last fiscal year by not I'm having sorry to, to interrupt Alder Ryan. I'm wondering if you have a question. Um, we'll keep it to questions so, right now. In my opinion, you need to have more public input. Um, I'm mentioning about the Westies neighborhood where people can express that as well. I would, I would suggest you have the whole board of directors as well as have a public social distancing meeting at the fairgrounds over multiple days so that the public can give that information. But in my opinion, you're blowing this up way beyond what our community can afford. Thank you. Alder Watson, please. Just a quick question. Um, you mentioned the uh, three phone surveys, right? Um, done by an independent consultant. I didn't know, do you have the methodology of those surveys, like sample size? Um, demographic, that kind of thing that you could so, share? Yes, we do. They, uh, they, it is summarized on our website. Um, I can tell you that the, the sample size was 400. It was demographically representative to, uh, the, the, to, the, to the Wausau uh, area uh, in terms of um, age demographics, gender, po political affiliation, um, economic status. So um, yeah, it, it was a representative sample. I don't know, Steve, did I miss anything in that? Um, east-west. Oh, in east-west, yeah. yeah. So you can, I could find that on the, the website? Yes, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other alders with question? Alder Killian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I have a few questions. Thank you for coming. Uh, you said that the surveys and the input process that was representative of the Wausau area, the municipality in, in general, I'm guessing. 
The school district. The school district, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, it was not representative of the uh, the directly impacted neighborhoods uh, of which uh, I've received a lot of concern from, such as in my district in the Lincoln uh, district and, and District 3. Uh, it wasn't necessarily representative uh, of that population, uh, was it? And uh, I would ask the same question uh, about the area around uh, Grant School. Sure. So there are a number of input tools that we used. One was the, the phone survey that we've already mentioned. There were three of those. And they were uh, demographically representative, uh, represented. Um, so you know, by, by race as well, and by, uh, I don't know if it was by ward specifically, um, but certainly people in your wards would have been contacted. Um, we also had a very unique input opportunity. We used uh, a tool called a thought exchange. Um, be not being able to bring large groups of people together, uh, this is basically a, um, oh, what's the format? Um, it's a, um, when you're trying to raise money, what do you call those? Crowdsourcing. Yeah, it's a crowdsourcing format. Um, and so what we were able to do was to ask questions. Uh, we did a, a several of these to the staff. We offered uh, one or two of these to the full community where we received th thousands of, of uh, feedback, uh, you know, points of feedback. And that all helped to inform the creation of this document. So we did our best to try and, and, and get feedback from anyone who was willing and able to share it. Thank you. I'm going to have to get a little more, uh, I think, uh, pointed with my question. I'm looking at uh, a federal level environmental justice uh, mapper. I, I had sent uh, in my email to the board, I'd sent some uh, numbers. Uh, these are from the EPA, but uh, they are not uh, directly uh, environment related per se. Um, so, for example, in my district, I'm looking at an area that's 52% uh, low income and 30% uh, minority. Uh, so using that example, uh, how would you say that compared to uh, your methodology and, and survey sample where 52% uh, or roughly, were, were they low income and were a third perhaps a minority? Does that, does that sound like it aligns with your numbers? It may have been 30% minority. I'd have to check because the Wausau School District is roughly 25 to 30 percent minority. Uh, probably not rep that, that uh, demographic represented economically. Um, so I, I would also say that if I, if I remember reading your research correctly, that's a, that's a study that, that tries to prevent hazardous facilities being created in those communities, isn't it? That is incorrect. Okay. What environmental justice is, it is twofold. And yes, the EPA uses it, but so does uh, just about every federal agency, uh, most state agencies, especially when there's federal funding. And I'm trying to convince our municipality here to use it, even if a project's locally funded. But essentially, it would do two things. And one, it creates an equitable, fair process, a public input process. And this, from uh, what I've learned, uh, did not look at equitable, it did not look representative or fair. And then, yes, in the EPA context, it does protect from hazards, such as industrial hazards, but it's a very flexible uh, concept in the sense it would prevent the types of hazards you described tonight, the hazards of destroying uh, schools in neighborhoods, the hazards of making our poorest, most disadvantaged children and diverse neighborhoods uh, increasing their time to and from school and, and also the hazard of extinguishing uh, their voices to some degree. So yes, it does uh, apply to contamination hazards, but it also applies to the types of hazards uh, the district is creating, sir. So uh, my final question would be uh, even more precise. Is there someone uh, among the team from the district here tonight who can answer, I guess, two questions. One would be, what was the median household income uh, in these uh, surveys and input processes? And then I, it had been referenced earlier that there was no person of color on this task force. Can someone confirm uh, for me and, and my colleagues, uh, is that accurate? 
I believe it is accurate. So the process to create the task force last fall, we had a, oh, let's see, two, pardon me. How many people did we have in ideation? 200? Uh, yeah, we had roughly 200 people uh, through 10 sessions, uh, ideation, people who were invited, um, people who were invited themselves. And from that, we selected, we, we were looking for a team of roughly 40 people. Um, that would be representative of the of the school of each uh, of the district, I should say, economically, racially. Um, so we we created a a, a a team of 60 that we invited that was demographically representative. Um, 40 people confirmed they would attend, and unfortunately, we only got about 20. Um, and you're right, uh, there were no people of color who attended those meetings. Um, at that point, you know, the, the purpose of the, of the task force was to help us here get a community voice around possible projects. Uh, they engaged in the thought exchange on many occasions. They also saw feedback from the community, the wider community, and from staff through this thought exchange process, which was sent to every member of our school district. Um, so while the, the, the people sitting in that virtual space were not people of color, uh, we certainly expanded this to every possible person in our district. So uh, no person of color on the task force, but we'll, we'll bus plenty of persons of color uh, across town out of their neighborhoods. That's what it sounds like uh, to me. So my final question, if at your convenience or the district's convenience, someone could email me the uh, median household income numbers, please. Uh, my final question would be more subjective, but uh, You've got a great uh, education pedigree yourself and uh, some experience, so it should be rather easy to answer, I believe. Do you understand how bad this looks? So when you have no person of color on the task force, when you have residents saying their voices weren't heard, when the, uh, you know, I guess we'll see when I get the numbers, but when these income numbers, they, they don't seem to jive with the numbers I'm seeing in my district. I mean, do you understand why the optics look so poor, sir? I, I do. I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Killian, may I uh, call to request a couple of your comments? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Is that okay, yeah. Mayor Rosenberg? If there's no um, objection. Okay, thank you. Um, I do just want to address a couple of things. Um, first, as it goes to process, I think absolutely we could have um, had some improvements in process, um, but hindsight is twenty twenty, and um, I feel terrible that people feel disregarded and that they don't feel heard. And I attempted to have those conversations and attempted to point out that this was about opportunity for students. Um, and, you know, I, um, I'm not, I don't want to throw any administrators under the bus because I think that they have done 150% of a job during the pandemic. Um, and I, it would be great if everybody could treat each other with a little more grace, quite frankly. I, you know, I kind of expect that in WASA. But were there errors in the process? Yes. What we can do now is learn that going forward so that we don't make those mistakes again and also look forward. We can't keep looking back and saying there was a problem in the process. There was a problem in the process. At this point, it's go these two questions are going to be on the ballot. So what it comes down to is the level of information. And to your second point, I just want to be clear that one big board decision was the fact that there were going to be students in Lincoln that would no longer be able to walk to school. There are students that go to Lincoln that are on the other side of Stewart Avenue that would be able to walk to school now in the new grant location. And there are thousands of students in our district that spend time a lengthy amount of time on the bus that aren't able to walk to school. So this was a consideration, but it was something the board had to balance against the significantly improved educational opportunity that comes with this referendum. So it, it's not disregarded, it's not, it, it, it's a balance. You know, there's complex decisions with everything here. And um, I just want to be clear that um, it's not that it wasn't considered. And I also want to be clear, because I grew up here just like you, and I remember the busing controversy. So when you make comments like that here, it, 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 
it's nothing like that. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the information. I will reserve my comments for the comment time, uh, Madam Chair. I guess, which comment time are you talking about? This. I believe my colleagues and I were told that this was reserved for questions, which led me to believe there'd be a time reserved for comments. Yep, at the conclusion of the meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Alder Ryan. Yes. Um, Part of the CISM committee has been looking at traffic issues along Stewart Avenue uh, for a number of years. And just in the past year or so, we've been talking about maybe uh, an elevated um, crossway for John Muir. So uh, I guess uh, how, much, how much did you do about traffic? Because from my understanding, students in my Westies neighborhood that live on South Elm are being bused to go to Lincoln. And so uh, I don't think you want to be encouraging ch children that are in the Worley Park area to, to have to walk to Grant School and cross Stewart Avenue. Uh, I do think from the pedestrian and uh, bicycle committee as well as SISM that uh, a major risk for, for students is crossing Stewart Avenue. I wonder if we could um, back up the slides to the one that showed the actual enrollment area, the close-up. It would be up several slides. We've been working with the city on uh, a number of, right, oh, I'm sorry, down one. Right there, yeah. So we've been working with the city um, for many years, frankly, on a number of our uh, traffic concerns around a number of our schools. Uh, I think this is addressing the, the concern you're bringing up. So currently, in the green area, which is the current Lincoln attendance area, students be, be, uh, north of Stewart, those students currently get bused down to Lincoln School. In, the, in this format, if we combine them, those students now would be able to walk without crossing any dangerous road to Grant. So they get the opportunity to walk. Now students on the south side of Stewart would be the ones who would have the opportunity to get bused. Wouldn't be required, but we would certainly offer it. Um, is that the, the transportation question you were asking? Well, I guess uh, I was just going to say that I think it's still going to be an issue for both Stewart and the but It's going to end up impacting more on Bridge Street where traffic and concerns about having a larger school there with, with already Newman uh, located on there, St. Anne's is located on, on Bridge. Um, West High is close to, so is, is creating a lot of traffic. And then being so near the downtown area, it's all just type of growing. And it's still gonna end up being very difficult for many students north of Bridge to, to uh, cross Bridge Street. So it just seems you're still having some major traffic issues that the city will have to deal with in, in the future on that. Um, the other question I was gonna ask, how much time um, and what kind of contractor did you have a look at Grant School to see if it could be retrofit? Uh, I'll introduce Brian Winterly. He's also here from Nexus, and he's probably the most knowledgeable about that. Thank you, Dr. Hiltz. Uh, since 2014, Nexus has been, has been involved with the uh, Wausau School District. Our team of uh, Nexus has in-house mechanical engineering, but we also have a team of architects, people that look at uh, en the envelope of the building, the roof and the walls, the, the site for civil and... and um, and uh, utilities, as well as uh, electrical and other other items. When we looked at, you know, Grant, obviously everybody sees the, the nice outside. What you don't see inside is are the wood floors that would have to be totally redone to bring it up to, you know, it, it's creaky when you walk through it, right? It would have to be retrofitted for HVAC. So we definitely looked at that. We looked at that option, and then that's how we compared it to a new school and comparing the investment from Lincoln and Grant to a new grant, 
that is a model school. I wouldn't call it a large school. It, it's about the same size as Riverview, if anybody's been there. So it would be a model school. And combining those two, you look at a facility conduct condition index, and when the when the when the facility meets about 60 to 75 percent of the needed renovations, and when you compare it to a new school, that's when um, industry practice tells you that the wiser investment is to get a new school. And after after you've done after you've spent uh, 16 million dollars for a, a, a grant, let's say with all the additions, because the secure secure office is on the second floor. You have to be buzzed in. It's a it's a security issue. When you take all those things into account, uh, industry practice tells you that it's wiser to build a new school. Okay. Um, have you worked on many um, other buildings that have been historic buildings and rehabbing them from being brick and steel beams and being retrofit? Uh, our company has and other contractors in the area have me personally no, but um, We've looked at other school districts uh, uh, Specifically Racine we just went through this where there's many many schools that were built before Lincoln was was president and uh, And those when we looked at all those all five of those were beyond the point of r repair uh, this isn't a historic courthouse where it's where, it, where a lot of the functions are the same education has evolved from 1910 to 2020 so that's why looking at the the, the all the needed upgrades to, to the existing grant uh, there were too many limitations there to when you compared it to a brand new uh, 400 student uh, school much like Riverview so d did your other colleagues be involved in this decision then that are are familiar with historic buildings that are yes. just the brick yep. and the seal beams and retrofitting and giving their their recommendations can grant be renovated absolutely but when you compare it to the advantages of a new school that's when when the tally started getting up to 60 to 70 percent of a brand new school uh, it's industry practice tells you that it's time to invest in a new school it's very common I guess I don't find it as common for myself, but I, back in the 80s, I um, took a position downtown uh, in the South Loop. They had old printers buildings on South Federal Street and on Dearborn and on Michigan Avenue that were vacant. They stripped them to brick and steel beams. They retrofitted them. It ended up becoming the newest neighborhood, Printers Row. Also, a lot of other buildings, other motels, and became condos. So I have seen dozens and dozens of buildings that can be redone. And I guess I, I just don't think you've put the, the research in it. Doesn't sound like you were given that alternative of what you can do to keep it historic. Uh, we did. We, we, look, we compared remodeling it and we had Well, I'd like to see the details of that sure. information. Uh, and um, other question, um, what, since the pandemic, um, I guess I'd like to see some financial reports of why you weren't saving a few million dollars with, with not having students at the schools the last few months. You should have saved lots of money on utilities and maybe 150000 flushes of the toilet a day. I can answer part of that question. As a matter of fact, the state legislature passed Act 185 that requires every school district to do exactly that. And it's going to be due in the next month, and you'll be able to not only read what the Wausau School District spent extra during the pandemic versus what we saved during the pandemic, because there's some of each, we are spending quite a bit extra in certain areas, including technology infrastructure, connectivity, uh, professional development. Uh, some federal funding is coming our way to fund some of those things. Uh, but Act 185, the state of Wisconsin, will allow you to look at that for every single school district in the state. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looks like we don't have any other questions. 
Thank you uh, to the Wessel School District Administration and, and folks for presenting to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Killian, second by Martins. Uh, is there any discussion? I think we're ready to vote, but don't put your sh push your button yet. Wait until Clerk Leslie calls you to. It's not working, so we're going to have to do it by roll call. Old fashioned time. <laughs> Peckham? Aye. Thank you. Martins? Aye. Killian? Aye. Neil? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. McElhaney? Aye. Watson? Aye. Herbst? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you very much. We're moving on to file number 200903, Mayor's Appointments. I have one appointment, uh, appointing Alder Killian to the Liberation and Freedom Committee, replacing Alder Neal. Do I have a motion? Motion by Neal, second by Larson. Any discussion? We're ready to vote. Peckham? Aye. Martins? Aye. Killian? Aye. Neal? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. McElhaney? Aye. Watson? Aye. Herbst? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Moving on to file number 191109. It's a res uh, resolution from the Finance Committee approving the 2020 budget modification for parks, playground, equipment. Do I have a motion? Motion by Watson, second by Wadinski. Is there any discussion? No, nope. seeing none. I think we're ready to vote. Peckham? Aye. Martins? Aye. Killian? Aye. Neal? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. McElhaney? Aye. Watson? Aye. Herbst? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, I'm looking for a motion to suspend the rules. 6B filing, uh, two-thirds vote majority is required. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion by Neil, second by Watson. Any discussion? Ready to vote. Peckham? Aye. Martins? Aye. Killian? Aye. Neil? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. McElhaney? Aye. Watson? Aye. Herbst? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Rules are suspended. Uh, we're looking at file number 191109. It's a resolution from the Finance Committee approving the 2020 budget modification for elections. Um, before I take a motion, I just want to give you a little bit of background on this. Um, we are looking at doing a couple of updates to our absentee voting process. Um, that includes drive drive through voting is what we're calling it. Um, we're closing down a couple of streets. We are hiring some more election workers so folks can come in and vote. Kind of, I think our finance director has been describing it as Culver's. Show up, you get your number, you give your ID, you get your ballot, um, and you kind of pull around, you'll vote, and then you'll give your ballot to one of our election workers who will then make sure that it's properly and securely uh, deposited into our fancy new box. Um, so you've probably noticed that during the pandemic we have been holding almost two separate elections, one absentee election, <laughs> Clerk Leslie's nodding, and then one in-person election on election day. So this isn't going to save us any money, but hopefully it'll give, uh, it'll space out some of our electors. We'll be able to give folks an opportunity to vote on the weekend, which is something we haven't done before unless you requested a ballot. Um, so that is what you're voting on is uh, funding. Uh, to be moved around to make sure that we can do this. So I would entertain a motion to approve this. Motion by Herb, second by Watson. Is there any discussion? Yes, Alder Martins. Okay, thank you. I just want to and um, just want to add a couple other things. We did discuss this in the finance committee meeting earlier this evening, and it did pass uh, unanimously in the finance committee. It does increase our um, voting our elections budget by a significant amount, but uh, some of the things in addition to um, the drive-through vo voting that the mayor talked about, it also 
is going to pay uh, the increased cost of the absentee ballots. You've probably seen in the mail, you know, the Elections Commission sent out a letter to every registered voter notifying them that they can request an absentee ballot and this will help. And, and us um, at City Hall moving around some funds will help pay for those expenses that, for the significant amount of absentee ballots that are expected to come in the upcoming national election. So like I said, it, it passed unanimous, unanimously from the Finance Committee. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on this? Yes, Alder Larson. Um, when, you say, when you say this is going to increase it significantly, do you have a dollar amount? I, I, oh. I uh, do. So the original, uh, the budget is $144,716 uh, through August, because of course we had an election in August. Uh, our expenses to date are $160,000, so we're already over budget. Um, I'm predicting about $56,000 for the no November election. Um, and then we have a placeholder of uh, about $10,000 for the drive through voting. Um, we're expecting to use three police uh, personnel, three DPW um, election workers. Did, was it 10? About, about 15 to 20. Yeah, 20 election workers and then um, staff that would be working on Saturday and Friday night. So. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I think we're ready to vote. Ryan? Aye. Larson? Aye. Hertz? Aye. Watson? Aye. McElhaney? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. Neal? Aye. Killian? Aye. Martins? Aye. Peckham? Aye. Motion passes 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to need election workers, so yeah. <laughs> talk to the clerk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I guess we're moving on now to public comment. If there is anyone else who'd like to publicly comment, looks like everyone did or left. Um, and then I'll move on uh, to commentary from this body, if Alder Killian would like to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Is it all right if I do it from my seat, or do oh. I have to approach the podium? Please. All right, great. Uh, well, uh, I, I thank the uh, the school, uh, some of the school board and the administration for, for coming, but I believe, in my opinion, uh, that uh, the concerns voiced by residents and citizens, particularly uh, in my district, and I know there were many from uh, Alder Larson's district as well, uh, I believe those appear well-founded, and an assessment of the numbers in that area of town demonstrate that there is a, a higher percentage uh, of low-income residents and also people of color than in other areas of town. And as we know historically, this, this body and building knows well that that area of town has uh, kind of shouldered a, a, I think it'd be accurate to say, a disproportionate uh, burden uh, in certain ways on policy. I think that what this body has done in, in recent months has been very positive in equalizing uh, some of those burdens and, and giving people a voice. I, I sense encouragement and hope and even a semblance of trust uh, in that area of town which had been absent for many years due to uh, certain policies which created, a, I believe, a disparate impact and, and not just municipal policies. So uh, I guess I would say as an individual, and if I'm allowed to say as a representative, that I feel that the school district's public input process may have been severely flawed. It may not have been representative. I believe this will create a disparate impact on some of our most vulnerable children and families. And as an individual, and if I'm allowed as a representative, I would encourage uh, my constituents and the public at large, uh, friends, neighbors, and allies on the left, right, and center to not only vote against this, but to put it down so decisively that the thought of creating this type of burden for our poorest children and our communities of color is not entertained again for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Killian. Alder Ryan. Mm. Uh, thank you. I, I was just going to say that um, 
I am concerned as, as what Tom was mentioning too, especially I thought when you look at the overall city population that um, the largest minority is about 5% of our population. So for the overall city. So you're, if you're seeing 20 to 30% of minorities in certain neighborhoods, that's, that's a larger amount that, that needs to be considered. And there are, through the Chamber of Commerce um, or, or, or leadership groups or through the United Way, different committees, there is ways to recruit other people so to make sure that you can get uh, a really uh, diverse group of, of professionals that could have been available to do the task force. And then it's surprising to me that I was thinking somehow it was 400 and then they said it was 40 and then they only got 20. So it just seems like the information could have been skewed one way or the other with so, so limited information. And that um, I know in the past, I think five or 10 years, uh, some of the outstanding staff that started the ESL program had retired so that you have this change in focus of thinking, well, we don't need this anymore and that should, people should just be um, totally um, not needing the ESL as language in that. And then over the years, um, I've learned from NTC through their learning center that they were not allowing, uh, especially um, people from Southeast Asia, to use the learning center indefinitely to learn language or basic skills in the different areas to get up to ready to prepare for college unless they were in a short period of time going to be ready for college. For, so for some of the, the different Southeast Asian parents, they may have been starting at a very low level and working on it and working on it over a period of time. And I, I believe in the past as well that the school district was working in learning English and in schooling the, the, the parent with the child at the same time. I don't know if that's allowed any further uh, but there, there is some things that were pretty extraordinary and in helping the uh, Southeast Asians come and how to help them and to help better in their education. Um, but in my opinion, um, when I had talked to a few school board members by phone, I was told the only thing wrong with Grant School was air conditioning. And it seems that there's other issues that they're, they're talking about uh, but I, in my opinion, I don't think they really want to keep that historical char uh, character. And um, to me, it just seems like it wants to be a modern building with a lot of flashy glass. And but when it comes to a fire or trying to escape, say if there's a shooter or whatever, it's going to be a lot of glass, but no windows to get out in a new building. And so I think there's ways that it could have been retrofit. I do think all along that the school board could have made things available, even with social distancing, to really get the word out. And thank you all. I don't Ryan. think they have got it. I don't think they really understand. Uh, but it's up to the voters to make that decision and let them know. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wouldn't. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second by Watson. All in favor? Aye. All right. I'm a, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Aye.